Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about testing for positive ions, sometimes referred to as cations. In this video we'll cover three different ways of testing for metal ions, starting with precipitation reactions, moving from there into flame tests, and finishing by looking at flame emission spectroscopy. One way to test for the presence of positive metal ions, also referred to as cations, is to use sodium hydroxide solution. Sodium hydroxide has got the formula NaOH, and it's a solution dissolved in water, so we give it the state symbol AQ. Now this test only works on a solution, and so if you've been given a solid sample that we suspect contains a particular metal, the first step will always be to dissolve that sample in distilled water in a test tube to give us a solution. When we add sodium hydroxide solution to a solution of our unknown metal ion, we get what's called a precipitation reaction occurring. And a precipitation reaction occurs when two solutions containing soluble substances are mixed together, resulting in the formation of an insoluble solid. And this is the thing that we call the precipitate. And this solid appears as a cloudy or grainy substance in the liquid that will settle at the bottom of the tube over time. We can use sodium hydroxide solution to distinguish between samples containing different metal ions because different metal ions will produce different coloured precipitates after they've reacted with the sodium hydroxide. It's really important if we're testing multiple different unknown solutions that we use clean test tubes for each solution and clean pipettes for each different chemical in order to prevent contamination of one chemical by another and this might give us misleading results or specifically incorrect coloured precipitates that would lead us to the wrong conclusion. There are six different metal ions that you need to be able to distinguish between in the sodium hydroxide solution test, based on the coloured precipitates that are produced. First of all, copper 2 plus ions in solution will produce a blue precipitate with sodium hydroxide. There are two different iron ions that you need to be able to distinguish between in solution and they are iron 2 plus so that means iron with a plus 2 charge and iron 3 plus so iron with a 3 plus charge. Iron 2 plus will produce a green precipitate with sodium hydroxide solution whereas iron 3 plus will produce a brown precipitate with sodium hydroxide. Then there are three metal ions, aluminium 3 plus, calcium 2 plus and magnesium 2 plus, and they all form white precipitates when sodium hydroxide solution is added to them. Whilst these precipitates will have various different possible colours, they actually all have something in common. The precipitate produced is a metal hydroxide. Copper, when you react it with sodium hydroxide, produces copper hydroxide. Iron 2 plus will produce iron 2 hydroxide. Iron 3 plus will produce iron 3 hydroxide. And aluminium will make aluminium hydroxide. Calcium and magnesium will produce calcium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide. So all of the chemicals produced as precipitates are different types of hydroxide. Now it might seem far from ideal that we end up producing three precipitates that all have the same colour, but we can actually distinguish between them by doing some further testing. Firstly, the aluminium hydroxide precipitate that we've produced is soluble in excess sodium hydroxide solution. And so that means if we had three test tubes and they all contained a white precipitate, we would keep adding sodium hydroxide solution to each of them. And the one where the precipitate dissolves once we've added this excess sodium hydroxide solution is going to be the one that contained aluminium hydroxide precipitate, which means the original sample contained the aluminium metal ion, aluminium 3 plus. Unfortunately, neither calcium hydroxide nor magnesium hydroxide are soluble in excess sodium hydroxide solution.
And that means that to distinguish between these original samples that we think contain calcium ions or magnesium ions, we need to do a different chemical test. And that test is a flame test. More about flame tests later on in the video. You need to be able to write ionic equations for the chemical reactions that are occurring when these precipitates are being formed. And to help you understand what's happening here, we need to zoom in on the crucial ions that are involved in the reaction. And we can work out what those are, in fact, by looking at the identity of the precipitate. So, for instance, when we make the white precipitate of magnesium hydroxide with the magnesium ions and the sodium hydroxide, since the precipitate is magnesium hydroxide, the crucial ions will be magnesium ions and the hydroxide ions, and the sodium ions remain in solution, so we don't include those in the ionic equation. And since magnesium is a 2 plus ion and hydroxide is a 1 minus ion, the formula for magnesium hydroxide will be MgOH2. And so the balanced ionic equation will have one magnesium 2 plus ion reacting with two hydroxide ions and turning into magnesium hydroxide precipitate. We show it's a precipitate with the solid state symbol and we show that the ions were dissolved in solution by using the symbols AQ. And then for aluminium hydroxide, since aluminium is in group 3, it will be a 3 plus ion, so aluminium hydroxide will be ALOH3, solid, because it's a precipitate. And then the reaction will be between aqueous aluminium 3 plus ions and the hydroxide ions, OH1 minus aqueous. Now, since we've got three hydroxide ions in the precipitate product, we need to have three hydroxide ions in the reactants. So we put that three in front of the hydroxide ions in the reactants. And this is the same for all four of the other precipitates. Calcium hydroxide is CaOH2, solid, and so we have one calcium ion reacting with two hydroxide ions. This is the same for copper hydroxide, which is also CuOH2. Two hydroxide ions in the precipitate, two hydroxide ions in the reactants. Iron 2 plus makes iron 2 hydroxide, FeOH inside brackets with a 2 and an S. So we need two hydroxide ions in the reactants for the equation that makes that precipitate. And then for the iron 3 plus, well, that's going to be the same as aluminium 3 plus. Iron 3 hydroxide will be FeOH3, three of the contents of that bracket with a solid after the formula, and we'd need three hydroxide ions in the reactants to balance this ionic equation. During flame tests, different metal ions produce different coloured flames, and these are distinctive, and so flame tests can be used to identify some metal ions. Flame tests work best with solid samples, but you could use solutions as well. But if you're asked to write a method for how to carry out a flame test, I suggest that you assume that you're working with a solid sample. Ideally, one that had been crushed up into a fine powder that is easy to stick to our equipment. The first step that you would carry out in your method is to place the sample onto a clean metal wire. Sometimes this metal wire is made out of nichrome. And then you put this wire into a blue flame of a Bunsen burner. And this could be the roaring flame or the regular blue flame. The important thing is that it will be a non-luminous flame, since we don't want the colour of the Bunsen burner flame to mask the sample's flame that is going to be produced. And then for step three, we would observe the colour of the flame that has been produced, and later on we'll cross-reference that with some known flames, and that will allow us to identify the metal. And then what we would do is we'd take our wire and we'd dip it into acid and put it back into the flame. What this will do is clean the wire and make sure there isn't anything left on that wire before we move on to a new sample. And that would be the final step of our method. We would repeat those four steps again with a new sample and again looking for the flame that gets produced. 
It's really important that we clean the wire in the Bunsen burner flame between each sample because this prevents contamination. If we hadn't cleaned the wire, we might have some of the sample left over from the previous test and then we might get a misleading flame colour, which is a mixture of two different colours. There are five metal ions that you need to be able to identify using the flame test and they are lithium, sodium, potassium, calcium, and copper. The charges of these ions are Li1 plus for lithium, Na1 plus for sodium, K1 plus for potassium. And this makes sense since those three metals are all found in group one of the periodic table, which means they've got one electron in their outer shell. And so in order to complete that outer shell, they remove their outer shell electron. And since the electrons are negatively charged, the metal ion will be plus one. Calcium is in group two, so it forms a two plus charge. And copper also forms a two plus ion, Cu2 plus, takes its symbol from Latin rather than from English. And that completes the charges of each of the five ions. The flame colour produced by each of these metal ions is distinctive and you need to be able to remember each of them. For lithium, we get a crimson colour, which is a form of deep red colour that stands out from all of the others. Sodium is a yellow coloured flame, although sometimes it looks a yellowy orange colour, but you need to be able to remember for the exam that the colour is yellow. Potassium is a lilac coloured flame, although sometimes you're allowed to say pink, but it is lilac for preference. Calcium is an orangey red coloured flame. This is sometimes referred to as a brick red flame colour, but orange red is what you need to know from the specification. And last of all is copper, which is a very distinctive green flame. Flame tests do have limitations. It isn't a great technique for identifying samples that contain more than one metal ion. If we've got a mixture of different ions, sometimes the flame colours can mask each other or mix together because some of the coloured flames are more dominant than others. And so a mixture of two ions might look like a mixture of one ion because one of the colours is standing out more dominantly than the other. Elements and compounds can be detected and identified using chemical tests, for instance the flame tests and precipitation reactions, and they can also be detected and identified using instrumental methods, which is a general term for not doing a chemical reaction, but instead taking a sample of an unknown chemical and putting it into some kind of machine, which is the instrument, and then starting the process off and getting some kind of a readout on a computer display, which is connected to the machine. The main reasons that instrumental methods might be preferred over chemical tests is that they are highly accurate. And accurate means getting close to the true value. So being highly accurate means that we're more likely to correctly identify the unknown ions. They're also highly rapid, which means that you can line up lots of samples to run very quickly. Each individual sample doesn't take very much time. And they're also highly sensitive. And that means you can test the sample even if it's present only in a small concentration. In other words, it works on a much smaller amount of chemical. Flame emission spectroscopy is an example of an instrumental method that can be used to analyse metal ions in a solution. Inside the machine, the sample is put into a flame and then light is given out by that sample, which is passed through a spectroscope and the output is a line spectrum on some kind of computer display. And we need to refer to it as a line spectrum, not just a spectrum. And this is not just because we see it as lines, but also to differentiate it from the continuous spectrum. And that's where we see all the colours in a continuous range, like the colours in a rainbow. And the lines in the line spectrum are produced when light is emitted or given out 
by the sample. And this is in a similar way to the sample giving out light in a flame test, except this is being carried out and processed in a machine. You can actually see a line spectrum using a handheld spectroscope by looking at the flame that's produced during a flame test. But it obviously isn't as easy to use this line spectrum to identify an unknown substance whilst we're viewing it with the naked eye because our brain doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the database to recognise an unknown sample and match it up to a database of known ions. We can use a line spectrum produced during flame emission spectroscopy to identify unknown compounds. And this is because each element emits light at specific wavelengths. And so if we measure this wavelength or wavelengths, we can identify the metal ion in the solution that is causing this line spectrum to be produced. And this can take place in one of two ways. In an exam, you might be presented with a table of wavelength data for known substances and for an unknown substance. And you'd be expected to look at the wavelength of the unknown substance and match that to one of the known wavelengths to reach a conclusion about this unknown sample. Or you might be given the line spectrum itself and you might be required to match the lines from some unknown spectrum with one or more known samples. And so as you can see from this example here, I've got unknown substance X and I've got three possible ions that it can be. And all we need to do is look for some commonality between the line spectrum of our unknown substance and our known substances and we can make the conclusion that X is lithium. Or potentially we could have a mixture of two different ions and this will mean that we need to match our line spectrum for our unknown to two of the known spectra. And then we can do this in one of two ways. We can try to match two of our known substances to our unknowns by looking for the common lines and seeing where they overlap or we could look for what is missing. We could look for saying that this line for potassium is not present in our unknown substance. So that means that potassium cannot be present in our unknown mixture, and therefore it must be lithium and sodium. Sometimes a combination of both is quite useful. Remember, in an exam, all this can take some time, but really this is all taking place inside a machine and so it's very fast and very accurate. The second way that we can use a line spectrum is quantitatively, and that means that we can use numbers to calculate the concentration of the metal ions present in a sample. And this works because the intensity of the lines in a line spectrum is proportional to the concentration of the ions. In other words, the higher the concentration of the metal ion in the solution, the greater the line intensity will be. And we can show this graphically in the way that I'm doing at the bottom of the screen here. You can see that we've got a straight line graph that is beginning at the origin. That means that we're showing that intensity is directly proportional to the concentration. And so that means if we measure some intensity for our unknown sample, we can read across to our line and then go down from that line to the x-axis and this will be the concentration of our unknown solution. And this would work for any intensity telling us any concentration. Okay. That's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.